welcome to the global press conference for Killers of the Flower Moon. And we are extraordinarily lucky and honored to have with us here today a man who really does not need presentation, as is one of the greatest filmmakers of all time, who has co-written, directed, and produced what, in my opinion, is a masterpiece, mm -hmm. uh, Killers of the Flower Moon. And, um, and we have questioned, Mr. Scorsese, for you from all over the world. People are very excited to talk about this movie, to ask if you get into your head a little bit. Uh, yeah. Personally, it blew me away. I was not that familiar with the story, and now I can't stop thinking about it and the movie. Congratulations once more. Thank you so much. <laughs> so, uh, first question is, um, what steps did you or the production team um, take to ensure that the Osage community felt accurately represented? Well, at first, um, uh, it was very important for me, as soon as I saw the book, they gave me the book, and I said, well, come on, can we be involved with the uh, anything that has to do with indigenous people and uh, uh, Native Americans. I said, uh, I, I had had an experience in the 70s where I began to become aware of the nature of what their, uh, uh, what their situation was and is, still is. Um, I've been uh, lively, uh, uh, unaware of that. I was too young. I was in my 20s. I didn't know. Uh, and it's taken me years. And I'm fascinated by how do you really deal with um, that culture in a, in a, in a way that is respectful and also is, um, it also is not hagiographic. Uh, it, it doesn't fall into, I think, Rousseau, like the noble, the noble, uh, native, that sort of thing. None of that, but something, how, is, how truthful can we be and still have authenticity and respect, dignity, and deal with, um, the truth, honestly. Uh, so as best we can. Um, having said that, that story, when I read it, uh, it, indicated to me that this would probably be the one that we could deal with that way. And um, uh, particularly by getting involved with the culture of the Osage um, and actually placing cultural elements, rituals, um, spiritual moments. Uh, people talk about, they use that phrase, uh, what, uh, what, uh, it, Oh, I forget it now, sorry, but it's the uh, uh, realism, uh, mystical realism or something. And now, this is real. You see the dream. The dream is real. The ancestors come. The owl is real, in a sense, in a way. And so, for me, uh, I want to know how I want to play with, with that world in contrast with the white European world. Um, uh, and I felt that this could have afforded us the possibility, ultimately, what happened was that we were dealing with the script um, on the basis of the David Graham book, which is excellent. Uh, the, uh, it, but the David Graham book also has the subtitle, The Birth of the FBI. And uh, for about a year and a half to two years, I was doing Irishman and that sort of thing. And Eric Roth and I were working. And we felt that we took the story of um, the birth of the FBI as far as we could take it. And I, we kept, I wanted to keep balancing with the Osage, the Osage. Uh, and it was getting bigger and bigger um, and more diffused. And uh, ultimately, this was supplemented by the times that we went out to Oklahoma and met with the Osage. Uh, my first meeting was with Chief Standing Bear and his group, Julie and Eddie Romhorse and uh, Chad Renfro. And um, it was very different than what I expected. Uh, they were naturally cautious. I had to explain to them I was going to try and deal with them as, 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 uh, Honestly, as and truthfully as possible, we weren't going to fall into the trap. We think of the cliche of uh, victims or the drunken Indian or the Indian while well, all of this sort of thing, um, and yet tell the story as straight as possible. What I didn't really understand the first couple of meetings was that this is an ongoing, an ongoing, uh, um, uh, an ongoing. Uh, situation, an ongoing story out in Oklahoma. In other words, these are things that really weren't talked about in the generation I was talking to, in the generation above them, before them, I should say. It was the generation before them that this happened to. And so they didn't talk about it much. And the people involved are still there, meaning the families are still there, the descendants are still there. And so what I learned from, from meeting with them, having dinners with them, 
uh, Margie Burkhardt, I think, uh, she was the uh, uh, relative of Ernest Burkhardt. She pointed out, you know, uh, and a number of other people pointed out that you have to understand a lot of the white guys there, a lot of the European Americans, particularly Bill Hale, they were they were good friends. You know, one guy pointed out he said he, he was Henry Rohn was his best friend. And yet he killed him, and people just didn't believe at the time that that Bill would be capable of such things. And so, um, you know, what it what is that about us as human beings? that allows for us to be so compartmentalized in a way. And Margie got up and talked about the fact that one has to remember, especially after she saw silence, they sort of felt a little more comfortable with me doing this. Um, she said, one has to remember that Ernest, her, her ancestor, um, loved Molly and Molly loved Ernest. It's a love story. And so, and, and so ultimately what happens that the script shifted that way and that's when Ernest, uh, uh, when Leo decided to play Ernest instead, instead of uh, uh, Tom Wright and by that point we started reworking the script and it became really instead of from the outside in coming in and finding out who done it, you know, when in reality it's who didn't do it. Uh, it's a story of complicity, it's a story of sin by omission, you know, uh, silent uh, complicity in cases, certain cases, um, and so that's what afforded us the opportunity to open the picture up and start from the outs from the inside out. Uh, the film takes place in, in Oklahoma, and you were adamant about shooting the movie there. <clears throat> People are curious to know when was the first time you visited Oklahoma, and what was your impression, and how did you begin to visualize the film taking place there? Well, um, I think the first time was uh, in twenty. 19, I think. It was, it was a little, uh, it's a little confusing because of shooting Irishman, doing the CGI in Irishman, which was a longer post-production, four months, five months, and then COVID hitting. But I know we were there before COVID. We had at least two trips there before COVID. And, and for me, the, the, you know, I am a New Yorker. I grew up in the Lower, lower East Side of New York. I'm very urban. I don't understand uh, weather that much uh, or, or where the sun is when you're on the set. You know, I was very, very surprised to learn that it's set in the West. That's because I was driving down Sunset Boulevard one time about 30 years ago and I saw the sun setting and I said, it's great. It's Sunset Boulevard. The sun sets in the West. I can't get the whole, now I get it. Anyway, um, uh, when I got there, all I can tell you is um, those prairies are quite something and they open your mind and your heart. They are just beautiful. And especially driving on these roads, straight roads through a prairie, and on, on both sides, wild horses, and bison, and cows. I put the wild horses just out to pasture for the rest of their lives. And it was like idyllic. And so I said, where, where do I put the camera at this point? How much of the sky, how much of the prairie, you know? Uh, should it be 185 or should it be 235? We've got to go 235. You know, you want to see more of this land. And then I began to realize that the land itself could be sinister. In other words, you could, you're in a place like this and you don't see people for miles, you can do anything. Particularly, it turns out 100 years ago. For me, 1920 uh, is like 50 years ago because I, I grew up in, I was born in 42, so the 1920s are the way 90s are now to younger people. The 1990s. So when they told me, "Why this is 100 years ago?" I keep thinking, "Why are we making a period piece?" I didn't go. It's like normal. I mean, yes, they're old cars, and you know. But so I said, "Yeah, it's not really Western. It's normal." And I said, "Morning, this is 100 years ago." And um, but when I saw that, and I realized this is a place where you don't need the law. I mean, you have the law, but the law isn't working that way. The law, and you can make the law work for you if you're smart enough, as we know now. You know, many people do. But what I mean by that is that it's still a wide open territory. You have law, but it's a wide open territory. So you're, the place, as beautiful as it is, can uh, shift to being very sinister. And uh, what I wanted to capture ultimately was the very nature of the virus or the cancer that creates this sense of a kind of easygoing genocide. That's um, 
that's why that's why we went with the story with Molly and Ernest because that's the basis of the love. The love is the basis of trust. So when there's betrayal that way, that deep, and we know that for a fact that it was that it was that way. Here's our story. Following up on something you just mentioned, uh, can you discuss your creative decision <clears throat> and how you wanted to tell this story, both historically accurate but emotionally resonant? This was a constant, uh, the historically accurate, uh, and I should say, use the word truthful. Um, you know, you can have a you can have a ritual, and you shoot a ritual is the way it should be. But it may have been slightly different at the time, and you could we had many many uh, we had uh, a lot of support from the Osage, um, uh, uh, the Osage authority, the uh, uh, experts who were giving us. Uh, uh, the indication of how, how to go about these things, Johnny Williams and uh, a number of other people. Um, and so uh, with them, we tested the accuracy of the rituals, the baby namings, the wedding, um, the uh, funerals, everything that happened at the funerals, uh, all of this sort of thing. Um, and so in some cases, there was wiggle room because quite honestly, I think the last two generations of Osage um, forgot about or was taken out of their out of their experience because they had to become like white European. They had to become, you know, Christians, Catholics, whatever. And so they forgot about all that. In fact, there's a new resurgence of learning of the language. And we had language teachers there, and Lily and Gladstone learned the language, and so did Leo, and so did De Niro, who really fell in love with it. We wanted to do more scenes in Osage, uh, but I suggest that maybe it's too much for him, but, but uh, <laughs> he just liked the sound of it. And so they were all learning again to put their culture back together through this movie. And we were going with them, so what actually, if, if, if this person puts the blanket on this way in the baby name, is that right? Well, one person would say maybe yes, another would say maybe no, another one would say you, you have a little room here to play with it and have some creative license. So that's the way we did it throughout every scene that way. And that was done a lot of pre-production and during the shoot. So we had that as a basis. Uh, and there are ways, there are ways, they were never insistent, but there were ways they got to me certain information. Um, and where it was Marianne Bauer, for example, was a, one of our producers and she's like my archivist. And she was able to help keep it all together between myself and the, uh, uh, the Osage. Speaking of Lily Gladstone, um, who of course plays Molly and his wife, I think people are going to be really impressed with her performance. Um, <clears throat> can you talk a little bit about the first scene that you shot with her? Well, um, I believe, you know, I saw her, Ellen Lewis showed her to me in certain women, Kelly Reichardt's film. Uh, that she was terrific. And then COVID hit and we weren't able to meet. So after COVID, after the pandemic was calming down, we met on Zoom. And I was very, very impressed by uh, her presence, uh, the intelligence and the emotion that's there in her face, but you see, you feel it, but it's very, very, uh, you know that it's all working, something working behind the eyes. You can see it happening. Um, also her activism, um, which wasn't overtaking the art. In other words, the art was in the activism, in a sense, so the art takes over um, in a way which we think then would be more resonant later on after you see the movie, you may be thinking about it more rather than a person preaching at you. Um, and I think the first big scene we did was one of my favorite scenes where she has dinner with um, Ernest alone. And uh, uh, she's questioning him, a little bit of interrogation. What are you doing here? Are you afraid of him? What's your religion? All this sort of thing. And then his, you begin to see there the connection between the two. Um, and when she says, ha ha, Coyote wants money. And, he goes, and, and surprisingly, he said, that's right, I love money. So she knows. This is the other thing. She knows what she's getting into. And her, even her sisters later, which is also a scene that we put in with the uh, Osage, with the uh, Native American actors, they said, what if we're talking about the guys while well, they're playing that game? 
and we're talking about my husband and talking about that guy with the blue eyes likes you and, and you know, well, I don't think he just wants money. Well, it doesn't matter. He's nice. He wants to settle down. Why don't we just show that that's how it could happen? So we, that's the way the script was ultimately uh, uh, created by these moments. So Lily, there was that scene and of course the scene where he's driving her in the taxi and uh, it's only one shot and he says something about, uh, you know, I want to see who's going to be in this horse race. And she answers in Osage. Uh, she, and she says something in Osage. He goes, what'd you say? And she says in Osage again. And he says, well, I don't know what that was, but it must have been Indian for handsome devil. And that's an improv. And you see her laugh for real. So that, that moment, you have the actual relationship. It's actually between the two actors. Yeah. So these were the two moments we felt very comfortable with her. Um, and also, we had a feeling that mm, we needed her. We needed her to help us tell her tell the story of the women there. And we would always check with her and work with her on the script. There were scenes that were added, scenes rewritten constantly. So now let's talk about some people that you have worked with before quite a bit. <laughs> you formed a 20-year partnership with Leo DiCaprio and a 50-year partnership with Robert De Niro. Why have you returned to them both so often over the years? And what has stood out to you most about their work on Killers of the Flower? Well, uh, in the case of uh, Robert De Niro, we were, we were teenagers together, and uh, he's the only one who really knows where I come from, the people I knew, and that sort of thing. Some of them are still alive. He knows them. Uh, I know his friends, his old friends. Uh, and we had a real testing round in the 70s where uh, we tried everything and we found that, you know, we trusted each other. It's all about trust and love. Right? It's what it is. Um, and that's a big deal because very often if an actor has a lot of power, and he had a lot of power at that time, an actor can take over your picture. The studio gets angry with you, the actor comes in and takes it over. With him, I never felt that. I never felt that. Um, there was a freedom. Uh, there was uh, experimenting and also not afraid of anything. He wasn't afraid to do something. I just did. And years later, he told me he worked with this kid, Leo DiCaprio, and a um, little boy in, in this boy's life. And he said, you should work with this kid sometime. But he didn't, it was just casual. But with him, a line, something like that, a recommendation at that time, I think in the early 90s, um, is not casual. He says it casually, but he rarely said that. You know, really tell me, he really gave recommendations. And so years go by, and I'm presented with Leo with Gangs in New York, and we worked together in gangs. He made gangs possible, actually. He loved the pictures I made. Um, and he wanted to explore the same territory. And so we developed more of a relationship when we did The Aviator. And there was a kind of, towards the end of it, there was a kind of something happening in maturity with him. I'm not quite sure, but we really clicked in certain scenes. And that led to uh, Departed, and, uh, and then that became much closer. You know, that was a, a project where Bill Monahan and me, uh, the people we were writing all the time and recreating that character that he played in Billy. Um, and so during that time, he really found out that even though it's 30 years difference, he has similar sensibilities. He likes pretty much, you know, he'll come to me and he'll say, listen to this record, it's Louis Jordan and Ella Fitzgerald. I grew up with it. He's not bringing me anything new, but he likes it. Said, That's interesting. Why he, he'll call me and say, you know, I had a call, I had a cold, and I, I, I was looking at Criterion films, and, you know, uh, I wanted to catch up on some of these classics, and I saw this incredible movie. It's incredible. It's a Japanese picture. It's called Tokyo Story. Did you ever see it? I said, this was last year. I said, yeah. I mean, it took me a few years to catch up to it. I couldn't even understand the Ozu, Ozu style, seeing it was the first time in the early 70s, because we were used to Orson Welles, Cameron Zero. Um, and I, this guy got it from watching it on a big screen of TV. Uh, uh, and that's very interesting to me, to be open that way to older parts of our culture, newer parts of our culture, of course, and the curiosity that he has about other people and other cultures. And there's a trust. There's a trust. And even if we can't get it right away, we know we'll come up with something. You know, uh, maybe other people have relationships where they come up with it faster, but we don't. We just work it through. For example, the scene between Leo and Bob in the jail at the end. 
that scene ultimately was finally written, I think, a few days before we shot it, uh, working with the two of them and working with Marianne and everybody because we had said so much and it could have gone so many different ways, but what does the picture really need? How much more is there for them to say to each other after all that's happened, you know? And um, uh, so we went that way. Um, it's really, you know, it's trust, particularly doing Wolf of Wall Street, by the way. Uh, he came up with wonderful stuff that was outrageous. And uh, so I pushed him, he pushed me, and I pushed him more than he pushed me. We were suddenly, <laughs> everything was wild. <laughs> and, and it's really quite something. But, um, and he had a good energy too on the set. That was also important, very important, because in the mornings I'm not really good, and I get on set, and then I'd see him, and or Jonah Hill, or him and Margot Robbie, or or him and Lily, and suddenly they're all like, "Hey," I said, "Okay, let's work." <laughs> mentioned uh, music a moment ago. Your films have a musicality through your framing, camera movement, sound, silences, and where you choose to cut shots. What informed the rhythm of your work and what music were you hearing in the making and execution of this book? Well, uh, yeah, it, it, the way I like to make pictures, for the most part, I've learned, I've learned, or, or not intentionally, but I feel it, uh, it is like the pacing of, of music. Um, the boxing scenes in Raging Bull are like the ballet scene in The Red Shoes where everything is seen and felt from inside the ring, inside the fighter's head, the way everything is felt and seen inside the dancer's head, Marta Scherer's in Red Shoes. So uh, the covering of um, the band singing The Weight in The Last Waltz doing in a studio was very much according to the uh, music, um, to the different bars of music and how a camera would move, et cetera. So, and sometimes I play the music back on the set, in the case of Goodfellas, a number of times. Uh, the end of Layla, for example, was played back and we were doing the camera moves. Um, and, and so for me, ultimately, um, a movie is more like, I'm trying to get to like the movie being a piece of music. Because I think I've been, that's why I do I think these music films at the same time. I'm, I'm trying to get to the pacing and rhythm of, um, something that can be played, you know. Uh, for example, I don't know, you play a symphony and you live with it. How many times, oh, I heard the Beethoven symphony, I don't want to hear it again. No, you play it. Well, I like the third movement, I want to hear the second movement again. No, I mean, you live with it, you live with it. Um, or uh, Baroque music, Bach, anything by Bach. So, you know, uh, or Philip Glass, let's say. And so, uh, in a case like this, very often I leave, um, if the film is playing on TCM, let's say, I take the sound off and I just watch. It's living with me. I live with it. And if it's a Hitchcock or it's a Ford or you know a newer one, whatever, I'm looking and I can tell there's a musical rhythm to the pacing of the camera, the edit. What I mean by the camera is the size of the people in the frame, the editing, and camera movement. You know, uh, I could feel it, and so that's the way. I, that's how I exist in a sense. So for me, it's really uh really about getting the pace of music uh, and that's done very very carefully on set but also even more carefully in the editing that's why this picture is more like somebody pointed out recently like a bolero where it starts slower and moves slowly and in circles and in circles and then suddenly gets more intense and more intense and suddenly goes more and more until it explodes that way and so um i felt it I didn't, I couldn't verbalize the way I am now, but I felt it in the shoot and in the edit. Um, and a lot of the music that kept pushing me was what Robbie Robertson had put together, particularly that uh, bass note that he was playing uh, when uh, um, when Ernest drops her off for the first time at her house, Molly's house. She looks at him, she turns, and all of a sudden you hear bum, 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 bum. I said, I wanted something dangerous and fleshy and sexy but dangerous. And that beat took us all the way through, all the way through. Then I added like, he, he sent me some uh, uh, hymn, and I could pick up music from uh, 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 Harry Smith's anthology of folk music, 
all this sort of thing. In one particular piece called The Indian War Whoop by Hoyt Ming and his Pep Steppers, was very, very important. Uh, Bulldoze Blues by Henry Thomas, which became Going Up the Country by Can't Heat. All of this, uh, uh, you know, uh, Dark, Dark as the Night, Glamberly Johnson uh, with the Flames. Um, uh, oh, C.C. Uh, Ryder, uh, Ma Rainey, uh, and of course, uh, Emmett, um, Emmett Miller singing Love Sick Blues, which became the great Love Sick Blues by Hank Williams later on, but this was the first. So it's in all that's in there, but the drive of the movie is what Robbie put down, and we pulled it through that way. And on that note, I think we could talk uh, with you <laughs> about this movie forever. Mrs. Gosezi, first of all, congratulations. Thank you for making these movies that make us feel, that make us learn, that make us live. They are absolutely extraordinary film. They blew me away, and I, I just can't stop thinking about this. So congratulations. Thank you. Killers of the Flower Moon, all the luck in the world. And thank you so much for the huge honor of having you with us today. Thank you. Thank you so much. Good to see you again.